first reading is from Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet to Hannah and in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen, may the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the word that you have received to bring back to this place from Babylon and the vessels of this house, the Lord and all exiles. But listen now to the word that I am speaking in your hearing and in the hearing of all people. The prophets have received you and me in the ancient time, received wars, famines, and diseases against many countries and great kingdoms. As the prophets and prophets peace, we, the word of the prophets, comes true. Then it is known that the Lord was truly sent, the prophets, the word of the Lord. chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. Your love, O Lord, forever. Happy are the people who know the festal shout. They rock, O Lord, in the light of your presence. They rejoice daily in your name. They are jubilant in your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength. And by your faithful favor, our mind is exalted. Truly, our shield belongs to the Lord. Our King is the Holy One of Israel. Your love, O Lord, forever will I sing. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from Romans. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. 
When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory, Glory to, to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks. Praise yeah. to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, I mentioned in the newsletter, if you haven't had a chance to read that, that the, uh, the Gospel reading for this week is short, uh, almost deceptively short, and uh, that, that the complexity of the reading does not necessarily correlate to the shortness of it. But it is, I think, uh, a very simple message. Uh, it's just profound. That is, if you think back over the past couple of weeks of what we've been hearing Jesus say from the Gospel of Matthew, he has been often, these sections are titled, The Cost of Discipleship, where Jesus goes through and he talks about what all is put at risk in the disciples' lives as they continue forward following Jesus. If you don't remember what all those were, a short list is families get divided over it and, uh, and that the disciples will be persecuted. If you remember two weeks ago, Jesus looks out of the crowd and he sees that they are both helpless uh, and harassed. And so he sends the disciples in mission in order to be sent in mission. He invites the disciples to identify with that crowd. In other words, to put themselves in the position of being helpless and harassed and then walking with that community. Uh, and then two times then there are warnings about the division that can, that, that action of kind of resisting a theology of empire, we might call it, a theology of strength and power, and instead embracing a kind of helplessness can be divisive in many communities uh, and in many ways. That was the past two weeks. This week, uh, the complexity of what it means to be a disciple is gone. I, I think we often think that if we want to follow Jesus, it means, uh, especially after hearing Paul's letter to the Romans, we'll come back to that, but there's this kind of like need to get your life straight because Paul's talking about sin and its wages and, and, and then righteousness and its wages, and we want to make sure that we're righteous. I don't think that's Paul, what Paul's going after. Actually, maybe I should talk about that now. Uh, I don't think that's what Paul's going after. I think what Paul is doing is, again, if you go back and you look at Romans, the, the, the people that Paul is writing to are unconvinced that this gospel is as simple as they are hearing that it is. That is, they're very convinced that they ought to be able to kind of get a, to, to, to either be very uh, strict in what they do, because what it sounds like, what, what, what they think it sounds like is that, well, if grace is involved, we can then just get away with doing anything. I believe it was last week, uh, Paul wrote, uh, so then does that mean that since grace abounds all the more, uh, that we should sin in order that grace will abound? And he says, uh, by no means. That's the translation. Uh, and then again, this week we heard, uh, once again, since we're not under law, does that mean we get to do whatever we want to do? And he says, by no means. By no means is a very toned down translation of that Greek phrase. Um, Paul is being very philly in his comments there. Uh, it, it, a closer translation, frankly, would be, oh, hell no. 
Um, and uh, so that's probably not even Philly. Maybe it's a little lighter. But anyway, the point is, Paul's being very emphatic about this. That's not what it means, but it is, in fact, that free and available to us. Um, that that you're you're ask that he's saying to the Romans you're asking the wrong questions, but it is in fact this freedom uh, that we have. So what does that have to do with what Jesus is saying today? Well, again, we've heard this kind of complexity about uh, resisting these larger forces in our lives that are shaping us uh, to behave differently. Much the same thing that Paul's talking about, and and yet Jesus says if we go this other way, uh, it's there will be challenges. So is it difficult? Now we hear Jesus say, it's as simple as this. If you offer a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, somebody who's in need, somebody who's learning, somebody, little ones uh, could also just mean children, uh, but in the context of the Roman Empire, children have very few social safety features built into the society. Um, actually, for, for children in the Roman in Empire and in territories occupied by the Roman Empire, uh, life is at risk. So what Jesus is saying is even if you offer just a glass of water to somebody who has been pushed to the edge of society to the point where they are at risk, then you are performing righteousness. I think packed into that, behind all of that, is, is what Jesus is doing is inviting people to recognize that, that what discipleship means is recognizing the, the shared humanity that we have with other people and how that humanity is crafted in the image of God no matter who that person is. Whether they're at the center of society or if they're pushed out to the edge, the way that Jesus is inviting people to see it's not that there are distinctions about who's better and who's worse, but that there is a kind of equality that a disciple will see in that person that's pushed out to the edge with their own selves. So that this act of going out helpless and harassed may just be that simple. And, and I got to see what that looks like by chance this week in an unexpected place um, my cat, Thor, uh, he's a very old cat. He had to go back to the hospital for a follow-up. Um, my cat has appointments with general internal medicine and radiology. It's like taking my grandfather to the hospital. But So here's this, the cat, and I've taken him in. He's in the back, and we're wait, waiting to find out what's going to go on. And somebody came in with an emergency. Their dog had injured its toe, maybe broken it, but... Uh, the owner was distressed. She was distraught. Her, her pet was wounded, and she was weeping. And they hurried her back into a nearby room to kind of get her her own space, and then one of the technicians came out to the water cooler, grabbed a cup, filled it full of cold water, and took it into her. And I immediately thought of this text. We might think that something like that is too simple. But if you've ever been in that kind of situation where you're the one, your world, for whatever reason, has been so greatly disturbed, and somebody brings you a cup of cold water and hands it to you, remember the relief that you might have felt at that time. It does all kinds of things. That For me, it's like it's something else I can fidget with and get some of that energy out of. It's an act of kindness that somebody gets why I might be so disheveled. That somebody understands. All of that is packed into this a action, I think, of giving somebody a cup of cold water. And I think that's what Jesus is calling us to do as church. To recognize, to see in that other person the same humanity that we have and to act in grace as God acts in grace to our own humanity to that other person and to see righteousness and grace flourish in the midst of such a simple act. 
the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.